So welcome everybody to Building a Climate Resilient New York City. For those of you new to Taste of Science, um, we're part of a national nonprofit science outreach organization for adults. Usually we'd be holding a big in-person science festival in cities across the U.S. and in some warmer cities, people are doing that outside. Um, inviting you to meet your friendly neighborhood scientists in your favorite spaces. Um, but here in New York, for now, we have several virtual events planned throughout the end of this week. Um, this event is being put on by our New York City chapter. I'm Brigitte Gunderson, the city coordinator for the New York chapter of Taste of Science. And tonight's event is all about the effects of climate change on New York City and how to increase resiliency through science. So before I introduce our first speaker, I wanted to explain a little game that we're going to play during tonight's event. Um, so it's a bingo game, and the boards contain words that our speakers may or may not say at some point during their talks. So each time you hear one of those words, you can mark that square, and if you get five in a row in any direction, um, you win. So to create a board, um, what you'll need to do is click on the link that I'm going to put in the chat in just a second. Okay, that's the bingo link in the chat. Um, and what you'll need to do is create your own copy of that link. Um, so you can go to file and make a copy um, and then give it a second to sort of reload and generate a board for you. Um, and then once you hear a word on your board, you can mark it, you can highlight it, you can strike through, you can bold, whatever works. Um, and if you get five in a row in any direction, um, you can take a screenshot of your board or you can download the file by going to file download um, and email it to New York at tasteofscience.org, which I will also put in the chat and email us your physical mailing address and we will mail you a prize. You can also announce in the chat that you got bingo if you get bingo. Okay, so I think um, we're gonna get started with our first speaker. Before we start with the speakers, I just wanna remind you if you at any point have any questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. Our first speaker tonight is Marco Tedesco. Marco is a Lamont research professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. And he's an adjunct scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He received his Laurea degree and PhD in Italy from the University of Naples and the Italian National Research Council. And he then spent five years as a postdoc and research scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He moved to City College in New York City in 2008, where he founded and directed the Cryosphere Processes Laboratory. And he then joined Columbia University in 2016, where his research focuses on the dynamics of seasonal snowpack, ice sheet surface properties, high latitude field work, global climate change, and its implications on the economy, real estate, and climate justice. So Marco, if you wanna share your screen. Sure, thanks Bridget. And take it away. Um, yes, I will start in a second and I'm sharing my screen. Thank you for uh, having me and uh, thank you for having me again. <clears throat> I will have the pleasure, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Can you confirm? Yes, uh, if you could just go into the presentation. Yes, yes, I just yes. want to be sure that you see the right. Are you yes, good? Yes, looks great. Okay, perfect. Thank so you. thank you so much for having me. I'm going to start my timer so that I'm sure that I'll be on time. And uh, it was my pleasure to be a few years ago, actually more than a few years ago, to the live event. Um, it was very much fun. I hope we're going to be able to transmit some of the enthusiasm. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, as, uh, as, as you were mentioning, uh, my, I, I'm going to try to take you to a journey, and it's also my personal and professional journey. And uh, uh, I, as, as you mentioned, uh, um, I study Greenland, uh, the polar regions, the melting of the ice sheets, uh, sea level rise. And uh, over the past five to six years, I've been also working on uh, economic impacts, especially with real estate and uh, ultimately, uh, recently, with the uh, impacts on socially vulnerable populations. So I'm going to try to bring you on some of the, the work we've been doing and some of the thoughts, especially when it comes to New York City. Uh, so when uh, uh, when you look at, when you think about Greenland and Harlem or places like Miami, uh, the, the first question is, that I'd like to, you know, everybody to ask themselves, what does melting Greenland and people in Harlem or Miami they have in common? 
Um, and uh, if you think not too hard, of course, uh, that your face depends on melt water. What does it mean? It means that, of course, the more melting we have on, uh, on the Greenland ice sheet, the more uh, we will be uh, eroding and uh, removing the ice, which has a lot of implication for our society. But of course, the more middle water also we have, uh, the more uh, the coastlines will be impacted and the more population will be exposed. And uh, when it comes especially to socially vulnerable populations, uh, the physical risks, they are amplified by the uh, socioeconomic exposure of, uh, um, you know, of, of, this, of this class. Um, I wanted to share with you some of the work uh, that we do, you know, some uh, catchy images. Uh, this is Greenland. Uh, this is a hole through which a super glacial lake, uh, which are lakes that are forming every summer in Greenland because of melt water drained. Uh, you can see people for scale. Um, you see this is a canyon, and there's also another person for scale that is created by the uh, water, the melt water, surface melt water in Greenland. And uh, uh, when you think about surface melting, uh, this has been accelerating over the past uh, decades. It's not just that, what does it mean? It means that it's not just the sea level rise is increasing every day, every year, um, but it's also every year is more than the previous year. You can see from these plots the relative contribution in green from the green on ice sheet to the uh, total sea level rise, uh, and in the pale blue, uh, the contribution from Antarctica. Uh, even though we know that Antarctica has been, uh, has been relatively uh, steady until uh, a few years ago, a few five or six years ago, we know that from paleoclimate data that Antarctica has been in the past a, a huge contributor to, um, to sea level rise before Greenland, actually, hundreds of thousands of years ago. But uh, nowadays, what we're seeing is uh, really, and I'm sorry for the video, it keeps starting uh, by itself. Uh, but now we see that uh, Greenland has been um, uh, accelerating more than Antarctica. So we wait that the both giants are going to be contributing to an acceleration of sea level rise which we are also observing uh, over the next decades. This is not just a uh, um, sea level rise that we care about. Uh, it's really the combination, it's the recipe for disasters, which is a coastal erosion, extreme events like rain, increased precipitation, high tides, stronger and more frequent storms, of course, sea level rise, hurricanes. And in the past, uh, we've been, we scientists or in general society, uh, we've been focusing on uh, what's going to happen in 2100, what's going to happen in 2080. Uh, despite it's extremely important to look at that, uh, that period, we have to remember that we are already uh, perceiving, we are already experiencing the impacts, the consequences of the combination of, this, um, of these events, uh, coastal erosion, extreme event, um, sea level rise on our society. It's not just about the big hurricanes, Florence in the Carolinas, Sandy in New York City, whose anniversary is happening, anniversary is uh, occurring this year, a 10 year anniversary. But it's really also the small events that are small for us, even from a physical perspective, but they can have huge impacts on the community. So, as we prepare for the future, I, I think we need to stop for a second and think about what about the present? And the present means from economic perspective, it could be the uh, 20 years mortgage lifetime of uh, somebody's home. It could be the 10 year lifetime of, uh, uh, of, uh, of financial investments. It could be the five year uh, lifetime of, uh, of people who are trying to understand where to go or where to move it could be even the one year lifetime period of, of people who are not able to cope economically anymore because of one disaster, disaster hit their place. And now they're experiencing uh, incredibly strong economic hurdles to recover and they're forced to, to move out or forced to uh, change their lifestyle, which is already very harsh. So uh, one of the consequences, for example, that I've been studying uh, with some colleagues uh, in uh, Jesse Keenan particularly, 
is climate gentrification. Climate gentrification is basically the, um, is the effect through which climate change consequences amplify, catalyze, or even trigger uh, the gentrification effect that is already happening in some places, or it might happen later in some other places, uh, but the climate factors are the ones that are, again, catalyzing or creating the conditions for that to happen sooner or to happen in other places that otherwise it will not happen. Uh, for example, this can be due to residential uh, prices increase, it could be due to moving in of industrial or other sectors in areas that are climate safe. But bottom line, um, this, uh, these factors, this impact has, of course, the largest consequence on socially vulnerable population. And especially in, when it comes to the United States, African-Americans and Latinx. So I want to show with you one little one case that I started to work on uh, about a few years ago. Uh, and I think it's important for me to share um, also the personal driver for this. Uh, I was in the car uh, during the post-pandemic, it was 2020, when the vaccines were coming out. And I heard a documentary about people in Little Haiti, uh, about this person called Halba Hernandez, who lives in, a, or used to live in a mobile home, and she has, had been evicted uh, after receiving uh, increased uh, after increase on a rental, um, and uh, and she was living basically a thousand dollars a month. Her increase went her salary, her, her rent went from about three four hundred dollars a month to eight hundred within a year, and uh, uh, and she was receiving eviction after eviction. So she was completely drained financially, emotionally, personally, and uh, and everything you can think of. So I decided to keep looking and working more on this aspect because I asked myself, what can I do in my privileged position as academic uh, to, to help and to support these communities? And so I started to look more in this Little River, uh, Little River case. Um, I developed a data set, which I'm gonna to talk to you very briefly. But bottom line, the mechanism that you see happening in Little Haiti in Miami, and this is, very likely happening in many other places, for sure in Florida. And I'm sure there are many other places where we don't know that it's happening, but it is happening. And what happens there is that developers are targeting inland regions because of increased cost of property exposure over land, over the coastlines, which are historically very appetible for speculation, but now are becoming less and less uh, of interest for new generation of investors, especially then you start basically having also a high number of rental properties in this sector, uh, like in many places in New York, for example, in the South Bronx, 80% uh, of homes are uh, a rental. And, uh, and just also to make it very clear, these homes are owned by LLC. It's not people are renting their apartments. So there is a speculation behind there. Uh, these are uh, high-end elevation and high event shielded places. What happens, there is an uncontrolled and exponential increase in rent. Uh, Florida laws don't protect too much renters, especially if you're a mobile home um, and you rent the land if you own the, the home. So that's even harder to, to counteract. Then you have an also increased evictions and fiscal pressure of renters. People get displaced. There is a consequent gentrification. And then basically you have the gentrification that occurs through uncontrolled rent an eviction of socially vulnerable people, which is strongly driven by uh, climate uh, impacts and climate change. Uh, there is an example of this uh, in a place called uh, Crystal City uh, um, uh, in, uh, in Miami, which is a big condominium development uh, that has um, displaced uh, a huge mobile home park. And now they're building a $1 billion condominium, which it's basically, of course, continue displaying, uh, displacing uh, all the population who live in that area. And by the way, Little Haiti is the second largest Haitian community in the world after, after Haiti. And that became even more populated after the 2010 Haiti uh, earthquake. So we're talking about people who came to the United States in Florida to have a better life and now finding themselves also under a different kind of pressure. So this is the, really the question that I ask myself and I keep asking uh, to my colleagues as we try to do some, some work in this regard. 
What can we learn from a quantitative point of view, from publicly existing data set from a socioeconomic climate risk and housing perspective that can be used for climate justice? And I want to emphasize the publicly existing data set. Uh, I spent eight months putting together the data set you will see because despite there is a lot of proprietary information uh, or data sets you can buy, uh, there, is a, there are limitations that apply to those data sets in terms of how you use it, in terms of how you, uh, um, what can you do with that? And I think that some of the pillars of climate justice, uh, of course, which spills into social justice is a data democracy. Uh, they, we live in a data rich society, we have the illusion that we have access to data and we control data, but in reality, we are controlled by it, I think. And I think having publicly existing data sets uh, at disposal of those who are in the need of, of the most is extremely important. So with my colleagues, a group of students uh, at the Data Science Institute and, uh, and other colleagues at Caroline Hultquist, we put together what I call the CIFR data set the socioeconomic, physical, housing, eviction risks, which uh, is freely available. Uh, it can be downloaded at the link you see. We published a paper on the journal called Environmental Justice. And uh, the, you see on the right, uh, the different data sets. You don't need, of course, to read all through it. But what I want to point out is that this is the first, to our knowledge, data set publicly available, built on publicly available data that contains social vulnerability, uh, climate risk indices from FEMA, mortgage data and eviction data. One thing that I really um, also want to um, word or emphasize is that the mortgage data and the eviction data, they also split by gender, by ethnicity, race, different level of incomes. So there is a lot of work that can be done in terms of exposing patterns or identifying potential uh, uh, potential activities like the one in Little Miami or in Little Haiti in Miami that are targeting uh, specific ethnic or racial groups. Uh, and I, this is extremely important because there is a very little uh, information data or quantitative information for these communities to be able to build and be empowered uh, with this knowledge for uh, uh, building policies that can protect their communities or to be able to have a, 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 an equity, a, a proper um, uh, role in shaping the future based on, uh, on climate change consequences. Um, so, for example, we applied this, this data set to develop what we call a climate gentrification risk index. And uh, the area you see, the census tract to see is basically where Little Haiti is. Uh, we showed that by combining different indices like the rental index, which account for how much you pay versus how much you make and how, how densely the rental properties are in your area, the flood risk index in this case, and what we call the rapid displacement index, which accounts for the movement of people with a certain um, per capita income or unemployment in or out. So that shows that the tool we develop is really capable of offering the opportunity to identify and monitor these areas and highlight that we find also other areas in Tampa, in Jacksonville, in Florida, and so on. Um, we applied also a similar uh, tool to, uh, to New York City. Uh, in this case, for example, you see the um, you see the social, the hurricane socioeconomic and uh, vulnerability index uh, for uh, you know for the New York City metropolitan area, the heat wave socioeconomic vulnerability index, and the flooding index. So from here you can start looking and understanding which are the areas that are more or less exposed. And one interesting thing that I wanted to share with you also is that you can then combine the three of them and you can have maps. Uh, that uh, allow you to visualize which areas are most exposed and you can dissect these through with different income levels, uh, again, gender, uh, single parents or uh, African-Americans, uh, Latins, Hispanics, and so on. Um, this data set was actually used in a recent class I taught in a business school uh, and has been uh, used and adopted by several, um, many colleagues to, to continue working on this and we are actually now starting to use it 
uh, in the uh, framework of New York City panel of climate change in the equity section where I recently got invited uh, from uh, my colleagues and uh, we're looking for developing more indices that can help us understanding uh, how to better protect the people who live in New York City. Just to give you also uh, an idea, um, you can play, you know, uh, a little bit of, uh, of things like you can compare the risk integrated with the percentage or in this case of a Latinos population, or you can also uh, create uh, more uh, interesting uh, maps. In this case, for example, we combined uh, the building footprint in New York City with our risk index because New York City is so dense. Uh, you, can, <clears throat> you can use uh, um, census tract data to uh, identify building almost level. And my experiment, my question was, um, what can we learn? Uh, can we really identify some specific buildings or portions of, uh, of Manhattan that are already very exposed? And if you apply that <clears throat> to the um, lower Manhattan part, of Manhattan Bridge and Brooklyn Bridge, you can really see that the areas that have been highlighted in dark blue are the ones that are, have the highest flooding risk. And then if you start looking at which areas are, you will see that those areas correspond exactly um, with the projects that are between uh, the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. And, uh, and we think that this is uh, going to be extremely important uh, in the future to start identifying not only specific areas, but also specific regions within those tracks that are going to be exposed. Um, so this is another video showing you another section very, very similar. Uh, what I want to close, and uh, there's a lot that can be said, a lot that can be done. Um, climate justice is not just about, of course, um, it, it goes, of course, with real estate, if we're talking about with the racial segregation, historical, um, you know, um, it, which has been one of the uh, biggest social problems within the United States. But uh, also, we need to remember that climate justice, uh, and, and this is very dear to me, is also intergenerational climate justice is extremely important. Uh, if you look at the red lining maps from the 1930s, in this case is Richmond in Virginia, we know for sure now that the areas where you have more higher mortality for heat waves are the areas where red, that were used as red lining in the past. This is because even after the 1930s and when red linings was abolished, the red lining was abolished, there was no effort in terms of urban planning to improve those areas. And, uh, and so what happens if you think about the Chicago heat waves in 97, that killed 750 people, most of them were African-Americans living in redlining areas. Uh, I always think that the people who died in 97, they were kids in 1930. So when you walk around Harlem, when I walk around the Bronx and I look at all the kids playing around, I think about how much responsibility we do have to be sure that those people who are now kids will not be suffering and will not be some of those people who will die because they were born in the wrong place. So climate justice in terms of generational issues is extremely important. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, any of you who is interested will be interesting to connect and remember that whatever happens in Greenland, the climate change and all the impacts are just not physical impacts, but the socioeconomic impacts are extremely important because everything is interconnected. And thank you again, Bridget, for having me. And uh, um, um, thank you. Thanks, Marco. That was really great. Um, we do have some questions. Um, so the first question was: is whether you know of any city or, or if the federal government is working on policies that might help protect against climate gentrification? Well, uh, I know that there was a, a bill in the city of Miami that um, they looked at climate gentrification thanks to Jess Keenan work. Uh, I think their conclusion was that they were not able to isolate the effect of climate or, or on, on the gentrification. So I think uh, um, this was also one of the things that really upset me because it's almost like saying that you need to show that uh, smoking by itself has killed a person uh, or diabetes or precondition and so on. Of course, we know that's the case, but there are all a series of environmental and preconditions. So uh, it, it, this is also the reason why I wanted to 
put an effort more on a quantitative solutions and try to empower communities and uh, and others <clears throat> and try to come out with these maps that are strongly based on quantitative data to say, look, this is really what happens. These are the numbers. There's really a little to argue. How do we move forward? And uh, how do we just come with the fact that it's not just climate, but it's climate is a compounding factor. And uh, like in everything, as we create more tension, as we create more pressure on the communities, and as they are pressured also by the speculation related to climate change, these factors are clearly driving some of the gentrification. And, and that's, so there is no um, effort so far, maybe with, the, with the, this administration with, has put so much emphasis on the climate justice and environmental justice, maybe something will come up. Thanks. Um, the next question is um, whether you know of any groups or stakeholders that are using your CEPHR or, or CEPHR, I don't know how you pronounce it, data yeah. set, um, and whether you know of any you know, victories or wins that have come out of that. Uh, CEPHR was published only uh, six months ago. I received so far <clears throat> about 30 requests for using it, but um, I'm very excited and humbly uh, happy and, uh, and proud that uh, we are gonna be able to use it in the New York City panel of climate change for the equity section, um, <clears throat> because that's exactly my goal. Um, that was my idea. So uh, hopefully there will, be, uh, there will be some victories, but uh, in this regard, we are organizing, I'm organizing here a workshop at Columbia on June 21st uh, about data literacy. And uh, the idea is really to train local organizer, policy makers, and, uh, and, and community leaders uh, to, to know this data set is available, to know these tools are available. And the idea is like, use us as academic experts at your will. Uh, let's, let's make something more horizontal rather than hierarchical. And how do we make people to, to know that these resources are available for them? Um, so this is extremely important. I guess related to that, um, there's this, I guess there's a comment. Um, are you familiar with this website, opendata.cityofnewyork.us? Yes, of course, there, yes. Yeah, is there a, a way of integrating your, your data set with that? Or I, I don't know how it works, but. Yes, uh, so I, I just, uh, open data, I hope, you know, uh, the, the CIFR data set is publicly available. And uh, I, I'm, I've been volunteering, so to say, my time in helping people. Uh, my goal is not just to put the data set there and say, use it. My goal is, that's the data. If you have problems, let me know, because the, the idea is really to make things move forward. Uh, we are actually going to integrate the CIFR data set with the data set that New York City re released recently about displacement. Uh, and they have uh, data from 2020. Uh, concerning also health issues, preconditions. So uh, right this morning, I was talking with some of the colleagues and I was looking at the asset. So definitely, yes, uh, it, we're going to combine that. Uh, I would be very happy if people want to um, add that to the New York City um, data set. I think it would be fantastic. Uh, I'm very much open to support that. And, and again, as I say, it is publicly available and uh, and I'm happy to, to help people understand how to move forward in this regard. All right, and then I guess um, we have a, a comment and some questions, but in, in terms of, of what you can answer, I guess there, there, you know, we have a participant who's expressing, I think, some frustration with the lack of governmental action. Um, and I guess the question I would put to you is, is how much do you feel like you know, politicians are listening to scientists like you, do you feel like they're receptive and, or do you feel like you have to sort of fight to get them to pay attention to, to these sorts of issues? Well, uh, I think we need to start thinking about electing people based on uh, other priorities than only uh, the ones that are currently. Now, I think if people start thinking about putting climate and climate action and climate gentrification as part of their choices, there is a lot of candidates um, the action uh, that is coming from the uh, uh, from people, I think there's a lot of effort that uh, start with goodwill at federal level, then it filtered down at state level, and by the time it reaches local communities, it's very diluted, if not completely stopped. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be brief, but think about the eviction moratoria during the COVID uh, about the $42 billion that were deployed by the federal government, and then only 
two or three billion dollars were spent because they were basically a block at state and city level, especially in in, uh, in uh, places like Florida. So uh, that 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 aspect has to become more fluid. And I think also we as a privileged class, and I'm speaking as a white middle aged man, um, we need to start thinking about how what do we want to give up uh, in terms of our lifestyle and uh, and uh, the things that we we have. Uh, that are uh, going to help and support the growth and empowerment of other communities. Uh, this is, a, a, I think it's a very personal question, but uh, it does require a little bit of, as I say, peeling your own skin and feeling the burn and understanding how to move forward for that. But so I, I, I'm, I'm not enthusiastic, but I'm most uh, optimistic about, uh, about this. In terms of, of personal sacrifices, um, I mean, what are some actions that um, we as residents of New York City can do to, to help promote climate justice, you know, with, even if our politicians aren't able to take action? Well, uh, join the community leaders to help try to, you know, support the, the education of, uh, of, uh, of people who need to uh, be empowered by the knowledge. Uh, uh, try to uh, also, and I think one thing that we learned with the Me Too and other and, and Black Lives Matter movements is uh, um, let's let let the others, the ones who are interested, do the work and provide them with the right tools, and uh, let's sit in the corner waiting for them to call us. But let's not try to tell what's right or what's wrong. Uh, that's that's very important. So listening, and I think being more empathetic. In a, in a very strong way by, again, I try to understand the struggle and try to understand the, um, the, the, the issues that people are going through. And it's not just a matter of donating the money, uh, which is extremely important, but how do we, how do we basically make the next uh, generation of young students uh, from Harlem to be able to become uh, scientists at, at Goddard or at Columbia, rather than having one person over 100 how do we make them to be five and then 10 and then 20 and so on? And I'm talking about, of course, both uh, women and men, but of course the situation with women is even, is even more drastic. So I think in this regard, look around, uh, promote, pick up uh, a few battles and try to put down your energy and your time, not only in terms of uh, monetary, which is important, but also in terms of uh, contribution to growth uh, of, the, of the society and then spread, uh, and I'm sorry to use the pun, spread the virus of the empathy. That's a good kind of, of viral spread to have. Um, I think we have time just for one last question for you, um, which is, uh, does your, does Sefer work, like, does it work for other cities other than New York City? And, and if yeah. not, is there a way of, of, you know, helping people build tools like this for, for other places. Yes, the CIFR is a, a continental, it's all United States, including Alaska. So it's a census tract based. Um, so that's, um, that, that's available over the entire United States. And uh, uh, my idea was, again, to provide that over the entire uh, country so that we don't discriminate one aspect on another. And again, we, you can look at heat waves, uh, droughts, uh, floods, uh, hail, um, uh, hurricanes. So depending on the region where you are, um, you can look at different kind of climate risks. But uh, the idea was really to to cover the entire national uh, territory to uh, to empower different communities. Okay, just one last really quick question, which I already sure. asked you before, but I thought other people might be curious. Do you want to tell us real quick what your background is? Uh, well, I'm, uh, sorry. I mean, your zoom background, your zoom background. Oh, okay. My <laughs> zoom sorry. My zoom background is a picture from a helicopter, which I'm happy to move away. Uh, that I took over Greenland. Uh, and, uh, it's, um, it, we were talking with Brigitte, which about reminds me, uh, reminds us of a fractal. Um, and, uh, uh it's, uh, it's one of the most beautiful places. Uh, where I've been, and you know, often Greenland has been a, a huge uh, teacher uh, for uh, for me because uh, at some point you really need to close the loop. Uh, and uh, um, but that's uh, one of the superglacial streams that carry the water that will ultimately end in the ocean and is reaching uh, our coastlines. 
Um, so that's that's what you're saying. But Thank thanks. you so Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marco. That was really wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again for for Thank being a, a Taste of Science speaker for a second time. Um, okay, I think we're going to move on now to our second speaker. Um, our next speaker is Agata Poniatowski. I hope I pronounced that right. Agata has had a lifelong interest in environmental and conservation projects, and she holds a degree in sustainable development and national, natural resource management from CUNY, um, another CUNY connection. Um, as a uh, Billion Oyster Projects Outreach and Engagement Manager, she's involved in the Oyster Research Station Program, engaging with schools throughout New York City, providing outdoor education opportunities, community engagement, and developing harbor-related harbor informal education curriculum. And she's gonna to talk to us about restoration through education and education through restoration at the Billion Oyster Project. So Agatha, if you wanna share your screen, you're already doing that, great, um, take it away. So hello, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for this introduction. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about bringing oysters back to New York Harbor. Um, and like uh, Brigitte mentioned, I'm from the Billion Oyster Project. Um, and uh, though she gave me a really good spiel already, um, and just a little bit about me, uh, I graduated from the CUNY Baccalaureate of Unique and Interdisciplinary Studies, which means that I took classes and courses at Brooklyn College, uh, Baruch College, Hunter College, and uh, Royal Tinku College in Bhutan. Um, I really enjoy hiking. I own a ceramics studio with my mother, and uh, here are some photos also of me in the field constantly, uh, getting a little too messy uh, for my own good, um, but it's a really great time. So the Billion Oyster Project is a nonprofit working towards, oh, I should probably start my timer, sorry. Okay, I also don't wanna go over, so, all right. The Billion Oyster Project is a nonprofit working towards restoring oysters into New York Harbor. Um, and what we're trying to do is put 1 billion oysters back into New York Harbor while engaging with 1 million people. Um, and our goal is to achieve these two numbers by the year 2035. And of course, we need your help. So we were founded on the belief that restoration without education is temporary and observing that um, observing and learning outcomes improve our student um, help our students improve, um, you know, their sense of stewardship over our harbor. Um, so like Marco was mentioning, right, like working with people and kind of engaging them uh, with our environment and really truly having them um, take ownership steward and, and so we can kind of continue this restoration and um, work towards bringing um, sustainability, social sustainability to restoration work that we have going on. The crew, uh, you know, Billion Oyster Project designs STEM curriculum for New York City schools uh, through the lens of oyster restor restoration and engages Urban Assembly New York Harbor School students in large scale restoration projects, collecting discarded shells from New York City restaurants and engaging with the local community. Uh, we are engaged with over um, 75 public and uh, private schools um, throughout the city, and we have um, plenty of community scientists joining our work as well as community based organizations. Um, so a little bit about our stats. Uh, so far, we've restored 75 million oysters across 12 acres of New York Harbor, um, and these are throughout all five boroughs. We've engaged with over 8,000 local students, and we've also diverted uh, nearly 2 million pounds of shell from, land, uh, from landfill to our um, shell collection program, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, and we've also had about 10,000 volunteers uh, working with us throughout our project and our work as well. So one of the main questions that I always get whenever I do these kinds of presentations is why oysters? Um, and so I'm gonna go through why oysters and then I'm kind of gonna focus on the climate um, aspect of our work as well. Um, so why oysters? Oysters can clear the water and move nitrogen out of it. Um, they can also increase biodiversity in uh, our harbor and the areas that they're restored, and they can protect shorelines from wave action. So I'm gonna go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So first of all, we have oyster filtering. So one adult oyster, which is only about three inches, can filter anywhere between 30 and 50 gallons of water in a day. Um, so that's just an enormous and unthinkable amount of oysters. I mean, sorry, of water. 
Um, and oysters will be filtering as they eat. So when they are eating, they're clarifying the water and removing pollutants like nitrogen. Uh, and this is the most important, um, nitrogen is very important in marine ecosystems because in excess nitrogen can actually trigger algal blooms and deplete the water of oxygen and create dead zones. Um, so nitrogen, um, you know, is, is really bad in our ecosystem. And one thing to note about our, our system in the city is actually that we have um, something called a combined sewer system. Before I get to the next slide and talk about that, I just want to point out here with the arrow um, that you could actually see the oyster opening up and filtering. I know that most people only see oysters on a half shell on their plate. Um, so I just wanted to show off what they look like when they're alive and um, filtering this water as well. So what's in our water? Um, you know, oysters are going to be filtering our water. And so that can include pollutants from industrial waste that's been there for quite some time. The guanus is a very infamous example, but they're cleaning that out. Um, but there's also uh, wastewater from your toilets, from your uh, laundry, from your showers, from your dishwasher. So the system that New York City has designed for sewage was designed way back for a far less people than are living here right now. Um, and so what happens is when you flush, uh, you know, when you take a shower, anything that goes down your, your pipes is going to go into one big pipe um, and it's going to head over to a water treatment plant. On a bright sunny day, this is not a problem. However, on a rainy day, when we get um, about a tenth of an inch of rain, it can actually trigger a combined sewer overflow. Um, and what that means is that the amount of water coming from the buildings, as well as from the storm drains, um, is too much for the system to handle. And so what we have is an outflow. So the combined sewage from your building, as well as the combined, you know, the rain flow and the, the rain that you're getting on the street, which also can include the litter that you see on the street pooling up um, in the different areas where you see uh, the storm grates, all of that is going to end up into our harbor. Um, so we estimate that about 70, uh, 27 billion gallons of water uh, or combined sewage is going to be discharged through um, the system every year into New York and um, from New York City. And New Jersey also contributes a very similar amount. So our harbor is very, um, I would say, overwhelmed <laughs> with this. Um, and one of the main factors also of our sewage coming from our restrooms is going to be nitrogen. Um, so having oysters in abundance is very helpful because they're getting rid of nitrogen that, um, you know, our sewage is actually increasing in our harbor as well. Um, that being said, I just want to make it very clear that we are restoring oysters not to be consumed because this stuff will be inside of our oysters because they are filtering. Um, so you don't want to eat a New York City oyster for this very reason. Um, so one thing that we're doing uh, is uh, through a community science program. Um, this is a community science program where we have over, I think, 40 different testing sites around New York City. And we're using an EPA uh, approved testing method called IDEX. And we're testing for a bacteria called Enterococcus. Um, and Enterococcus is very widely known as the fecal indicator bacteria. Um, so a sample of 100 millimeters will be taken um, from different sites that have waterfront access, whether you wade into the water with your dog, maybe at Brooklyn Bridge Park, or you're a very avid kayaker, kayaker over at Pier 84, or you just want to know, you know, what's going on in your local waterfront. Is there more discharge happening maybe in lower income communities versus uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park and, you know, all those different areas. So we want um, community scientists to actually collect from their area and deliver those samples. So we've had uh, plenty of volunteers. It's been a really, really fun couple of years that I've been involved in this program. Um, so folks will collect their sample from across the harbor and deliver it to a couple of our different laboratories. Uh, in this photo, you see Sean, a teacher who um, is actually working over the summer and volunteering delivering samples. And then we feed the sample a reagent. And this reagent, once consumed by the bacteria, will, um, once it's consumed, it will be digested and excreted. And when it's excreted, it actually bioluminesces. So we can count how many colonies of this bacteria are present in each water sample based on how many blue boxes you can see there, or wells. 
uh, versus how many green. The blue ones indicate that the bacteria is actually present. So again, we don't want to <laughs> eat New York City oysters uh, because every time it rains, uh, we have a different amount of this bacteria. And this testing, uh, this testing system is uh, also used for, for beach closures or beach warnings, if you've ever seen that. Um, so a beach closure will be anything that you see on this chart in red. Um, anything that you see in yellow is a beach warning um, that, you know, the Far Rockaways or Coney Island or anywhere else will tell you just be warned um, or beach closures, again, are the red ones. And the green ones indicate that the water is okay to swim in. Um, so that being said, uh, you're more than welcome to check out our results. These are open to the public. Um, you can scan the QR code here. Um, and I know the screen is super tiny, so if you're interested, feel free to check this out. Um, but this whole line or this block of red that you see on the screen is actually from a um, hurricane that was, uh, that there was last summer, so, or a superstorm. I don't know what the government decided to call it, but um, yeah, so just so that um, you guys can see how that affects uh, all the different sites we have in the harbor. Okay, third, habitat and biodiversity. This is probably one of my favorite things. Uh, I'm an environmental educator, so every time I get to touch a critter and you know hand it to a student, uh, it's probably one of my favorite experiences. So anytime I work with oysters, I'm always incredibly excited about showing off the different creatures that actually live around our harbor. So I wanna play a game of a little bit of I Spy. So I just take a second and look at this photo. This photo is of a tank setup we have, uh, or we had at the Williamsburg Field Station, which is our storefront location uh, for public engagement. And we placed oysters along with other things that we found in one of our cages into the tank directly, um, just to see you know, what kind of life we could find. So first of all, we have, of course, our oysters. And I don't know if you noticed, but there's actually a fish here attached to those oysters on the right side. Um, then we have a barnacle. Uh, we also have some tunicates next to that barnacle. We have some red algae. Uh, we have an anemone. Uh, lots of people don't know that New York Harbor actually has a lots of different anemones. Um, then we have some green algae. Uh, we also have a goby hiding underneath the shells there. Um, and then we also, um, not pictured exactly in this image, but this was taken around the same time. We have these things called isopods and amphipods. They're essentially the roly polioli or the base of a food web. Uh, and these guys will live among our oyster reefs as well. And then we have a cunner. So I don't know if you see here on the left side, there's a cunner who's hiding between, um, you know, the cage itself and some of the uh, agarid sponge uh, that's growing there. Uh, then we also had some shrimp in this tank. Um, and then what was really amazing for us to see is that we found a nerve branch um, or a sea uh, cucumber in our cage as well, or sorry, in our tank as well. Um, so Oysters are going to provide lots and lots of uh, habitat and space for creatures to live over time. So the more we add to our harbor, uh, the more creatures we're going to see. Now, uh, I hope all of you are familiar with this movie, um, but I'm going to talk about this um, because it's also very cool. So oysters can help with shoreline protection. So oyster reefs can protect New York City from wave damage, uh, not necessarily storm damage because people think of flooding immediately when you think of storm uh, damage. Um, and oysters can't protect anyone from flooding, but what they can do is act as a breakwater. So if you have a large enough oyster reef, they can actually slow down the waves that are coming towards the shoreline. So I'm just gonna play this clip and kind of talk through it a little bit. Um, so in this clip, Moana is leaving the island. Uh, the water is very calm on one side. And then of course, here you see the waves are breaking. So why are the waves breaking so far away from the shore? Uh, this is actually because, um, and you'll see in a second, when she falls out of the boat, uh, there is a coral reef. And this coral reef is acting as a breakwater for these big, big waves that are coming towards the island. So when she falls, you actually see the reef here. Um, so oysters actually provide very similar protections. Um, so if a reef is large enough, you can actually um, have an area where the wave is breaking um, before it hits the shoreline. So again, oysters won't be able to help with flooding, but they will be able to, um, you know, help decrease the size of the waves that are coming towards the shore. Um, all right. 
So now I want to talk about climate. So I just, I want to be very, very upfront about this. Uh, you know, as the effects of climate change become more clear and cities like New York City become increasingly urbanized, people will continue to look for a very quick fix. Um, now, oysters are not at all a one-stop shop for tackling climate change. However, combined with man-made barriers and changes in human behaviors, oyster reefs offer a powerful natural tool for building and scaling resilience. So again, they are not the one-stop shop for solving any climate things related, uh, or sorry, not solving anything uh, directly related to climate change, um, but they can help with mitigate some of those issues. So I've already started to talk a little bit about shoreline protection. Um, so climate change is one of the reasons that our work needs to scale with urgency. Um, at just 33 feet above sea level, New York City is extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Uh, historically, oyster reefs played a very big role in protecting our shorelines, but the natural barrier was wiped out and we can't really rebuild it at the pace that matches the projected sea level rise. So we have um, a project called the Living Breakwaters, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, but this is an example of a you know, project that we can kind of scale up um, from something that was a small you know, initiative to something that's much bigger that can actually help um, with this impact of wave action on shorelines. So in this image here, you can see a smaller model um, that was hosted in the New York Historical Society of what this shoreline is going to look like. Again, this is micro, it's very small. Each one of these little blocks is gonna be about four tons, if I remember correctly. So it's going to be very big and it's going to be on the Southern tip of Staten Island. Um, so again, I don't have too much time to dive into it as much as I'd like. So I just put a QR code here to a very great article about it. But I just want to kind of go into, you know, the Living Breakwaters is an ecological and social resiliency project. And again, it's on the southern tip of Staten Island. And the primary goals of this project are to re reduce coastal, coastal risk, create and restore essential marine habitat, and build social resiliency through the design and construction of new breakwater um, structures. Um, so those are some examples when it comes to, you know, actually shoreline um, protections. So here we have another program um, that kind of increases uh, the amount of shell that we divert from landfills to our project. So in 2015, Billion Oyster Projects started a shell collection program um, and we were giving restaurants the opportunity not only to divert the shells from landfills, but also reclaim a valuable resource to New York Harbor. And uh, again, we've uh, almost received about 2 million pounds of oyster shell. Um, and this is kind of incredible. And I'll tell you why. So wild oysters, uh, unlike you see them in restaurants, they actually grow in clusters. So I know all of the images I've showed you so far are going to be oysters in a cluster. And there's multiple of them growing on one, one shell. And that's because in nature, that's actually how oysters grow. They'll be clustering and growing on top of each other. Um, so here in this illustration on the bottom left, you'll actually see two adult oysters just next to each other growing. And they grow in these 3D fashion, or in a 3D fashion. And when oysters are about two or three years old, that means that their, um, their uh, gametes are going to be stronger. They can kind of reproduce actually from a very young age, but their gametes are not going to be as strong. So about two or three years is usually the time period when oysters, um, you know, gametes are going to be most successful. So at that stage, oysters will release a sperm and egg into the water. Um, and the sperm and egg is actually at the mercy of the tides and the currents. But if they do meet each other, they create a um, larva. And this larva is a free swimming Dellinger, which means that it is the only swimming stage of an oyster's life. And it will swim around, again, mercy of the tides. This oyster larva is not a strong swimmer. And it will actually try to essentially smell, for lack of a better word, um, places where it could find calcium carbonate, which is shell. And then it will stick to the shell and put its foot down, literally the thing that it was using to swim. It'll put its foot down and that will go through a metamorphosis and this foot will become the bio cement that sticks the oysters together. So in this way, these oysters are cre creating this 3D structure, again, that are going to be filtering the water. So each one is going to be filtering 
30 to 50 gallons of water, while in this 3D structure, providing so much habitat and homes for other organisms. So again, I said two, almost 2 million pounds of shell. Each shell individually can house about 10 to 20 adult oysters on it. So something that I can hold in my hand can filter between 500 and 1,000 gallons of water uh, within the 24-hour period. Um, so our shell collection program is super important, not only for reducing the amount of shell that's going to waste in the trash, um, but also because we're creating this kind of full cycle. Um, and what's really amazing about this, again, I don't have as much time as I'd like to dive into this, but I do want to mention that we are working on a bill uh, with a West End Secondary School um, where we would um, hopefully soon be eligible for a tax credit, or not we, but restaurant partners and whoever it is that's donating the shells would be eligible for a tax credit for recycling their shells. So um, this is a drafted bill. It's still in the works, but this is a really exciting process, uh, especially because you can think that this would be a home for 10 to 20 oysters in the future. Um, great. So, you know, earlier we mentioned education through restoration. So beyond just softening the blow of powerful waves and threatening our, that are threatening our waterfront, oysters will maintain a healthy ecosystem by filtering water around them and um, fostering a home for this biodiversity. Um, oysters also offer a very um, amazing social solution to climate change. And Billion Oyster Project is providing hands-on opportunities for local communities and school children, um, uh, all the way from school children to retirees to acknowledge the realities of climate change and actively adapt to them. So here I've you know, popped some photos in from just the last two years, even during COVID. Um, working between, you know, kindergarten students to the Brooklyn Children's Museum, even on boats with the New York Harbor School students, and really just getting involved hands dirty with oysters in the water so that students can become the stewards of their own harbor and feel empowered to become scientists and feel empowered to take a stand um, to support, you know, climate change um, in the future. So I don't have too much time. I know I'm a little over. So I also wanted to mention we do have a really nice uh, developing community-based science um, programs, uh, one of which includes wild oyster surveys, which helps us understand the um, where wild oysters are actually surviving and thriving. Um, and then we have a couple of different ways you can get involved, whether it's through volunteering, donation, maybe visiting a restaurant so the shells can get donated, or helping me monitor oysters around the harbor. So you can always visit our website um, and uh, check out some more information and photos on our Instagram and so on. And uh, I'll be happy to take some questions. Great, thank you so much, Agatha. Um, following up actually on that last point that you made that about people getting involved, um, if somebody did wanna volunteer with Billion Oyster Project, how, how would they do that? And um, what are people able to do you know, if they don't have experience in this kind of science? Yeah, so we have volunteer days. Um, we opened up our volunteer, pro like we have a season for this in March. Um, every month, I think it's on the 15th, we'll release volunteer dates on our website and you can sign up through that. Um, I will say they get booked up very quickly. So just mark it on your calendars, the 15th of the month to just check our website. Um, and this is a really great experience. Uh, the folks in this photo here are volunteers and they were helping either between uh, sorting the shells, um, so cleaning and making sure that they're prepared for that larva to stick to, or they can be helping with building structures um, or like larger restoration work, kind of gabions or oyster cages for my program. Um, and then we also have something called the ambassador program where um, people can apply and become ambassadors for Billion Oyster Project, which is like a kind of a higher tier of, of volunteerism, uh, where you will either come out to the field with us um, and learn how to monitor oysters and so on. And then I also have a community science program within my project too. So I train people to become scientists of oysters. So it's a citizen science um, workshop where I teach people how to measure and uh, monitor oysters and they can collect data on oysters for me um, around New York City. I have about 200 cages that I need help monitoring. So it would be really great to have some more volunteers. 
Very cool. And obviously a, a very good thing to give people some hands-on experience with mm-hmm. the scientific process as well. Um, I'm going to start with a really quick question. Someone wanted to know if there are seahorses in New York Harbor. Yes, there are. So I actually pulled up a seahorse in November, um, which I was surprised by the cold water. But the in November, I was at the East 90th Street uh, ferry terminal. Um, and we have a couple of cages over there. I was monitoring some of the cages and that was my very first seahorse that I found. But I feel like I'm the only one in my job that hasn't seen one. Everyone else has gone and been like, oh yeah, you know, I've seen a seahorse. I'm like, no, <laughs> this is my first seahorse. Um, so yes, we have seahorses in New York Harbor. Sometimes when my colleagues are out in the field, they'll actually see them swimming around. It's very, very exciting. Um, and seahorses are an indicator species, which means that they can only survive and thrive in certain water quality parameters. So by seeing a seahorse, it's a really good indicator that our water is getting better. Well, congratulations on your first seahorse, especially (laughs) on the east side. I feel like that's traditionally been the lower water quality side of Manhattan, certainly. So yeah. Um, Speaking of water quality and and health, um, so we wanted to know whether uh, the oysters can get sick if there are too many pollutants in the water and whether you do anything to monitor the health of of oysters. So we partner with Stony Brook University to actually test what kind of diseases oysters are, uh, you know, facing. Um, Primarily, we're testing for, you know, essentially like the flu for oysters, right? Um, Something that just kind of is among oysters. Uh, We also had um, a couple of folks uh, working on heavy metals testing uh, and there was like, you know, interest in um, collaborating with us on projects that kind of expand on that idea. Um, I will say that New York Harbor at the moment, if you were to like walk along the harbor floor um, or scuba dive, you would see something that looks like black mayonnaise, right? And so a lot of our structures are hanging, um, which is very beneficial to our oysters because if you were to put just imagine dropping a spoon in a jar of mayonnaise it sinks very slowly and if an oyster is filtering and it sinks very slowly into this black mayonnaise or sludge and it opens up it will suffocate so um those are situations where we can't really um support as much unless we hang the oysters so it's not so much that we're testing for that it's just a problem with the New York Harbor uh, habitat, but we are testing for diseases, like heavy metals testing has been tested in the past. Um, So there is information on that. And I believe you could read about that in uh, reports on our website. Another question is um, what happened to the oyster beds that were originally or historically part of New York Harbor? Yeah, so there was about 350 square miles of oysters in New York Harbor, uh, which is about 220,000 acres. Uh, That's just like an unimaginable number. Um, At the time, um, oysters were just getting plucked out of the harbor and consumed. If you think about uh, anywhere that you see a halal, halal cart or a breakfast cart or a hot dog cart, most of those would have been oyster carts around New York Har- or New York City. Um, there was about 1,000 vessels uh, around New York Harbor just plucking oysters from the harbor to, to be consumed. Um, but at the same time where the city was pouring millions of dollars into the oystering industry, we also started to pour our sewage into the harbor. So over time, uh, whether it was through massive pollution from industry, uh, sewage, or overfishing, um, the oyster population was completely decimated. Um, So it's actually considered functionally extinct in New York Harbor, which means that the species, the Eastern oyster is, um, it exists outside of New York City and it's fine. um, And you could find it all the way from Canada down to Florida, but in New York City, it needs some support to kind of thrive and survive. Uh, So that's kind of also, you know, a really important part of our work. Okay. And then uh, we have a question about um, your work with students. Do you find that um, they're, you know, surprised about how much the waterways of New York affect them and, and how closely connected they are? Yeah, it's so fun. Um, you know, handing a student a crab for the first time and letting them just like absolutely freak out. Um, you know, watching students uh, go from, oh my God, it's muddy, it's gross to like actually really just like kind of having to beg them to get the oysters back in the water. They're just so excited about it. 
Um, so one of the things I'd love to mention is that we have a annual symposium. Um, this is a symposium where students actually will present research about what they've been doing about oysters all year round. Um, so in the past years, we had uh, about 250 students participating with like 40, 75 different projects that they've submitted. And what's really amazing about this is that they're educating us. Um, you know, we are a small nonprofit and we're also learning. We've been around since 2014. Um, and we've had projects where students are either redesigning our cages because their specific site has a lot of wave action. So they put springs on it to make sure that it doesn't bounce around. Or we've had students that are doing a little bit more advocacy work. So I mentioned the bill from the West End Secondary School, but we've also had students that are learning about the CSO problem, the combined sewer system problem. And even though that they're further inland, uh, one student had started to collect all of the garbage that was just on his street. And they started to build a um, sculpture in their front yard out of the garbage and had pamphlets informing the folks on their street that all of this stuff is going to end up in the drain, which will then end up in New York Harbor. So even though the student was so far inland, he still could connect to what, you know, his local environment is going to affect New York Harbor. And that's like probably one of my favorite um, projects I've actually ever seen at a, symposi at a symposium. Very inspiring. Um, yeah, it sounds like you guys are doing great work all around. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak to us this evening. And, um, you know, if anybody has any questions for Agata in the future, I think you can probably put them in the chat and maybe she'll be able to answer them. Um, okay. Uh, thanks so much. And we're going to move on now to our third speaker, Richard, if you want to turn on your video. So our third and final um, speaker is Richard Roark. Um, he holds a master's in landscape architecture and community planning, and he's a partner at Olin Studios. Richard's work spans a range of scales and typologies focused on expanding the civic capacity of the landscape. His projects have included the competition winning design for Hunts Point under the Rebuild by Design Initiative, the new U.S. Embassy in London, Dilworth Park in Philadelphia, and he's currently helping lead the development of the Los Angeles River Master Plan, which is a new unified vision for the 51 mile corridor to reconnect the river to the diverse communities of LA County and to one another while addressing significant flooding risks along the river corridor. So uh, Richard, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, hopefully that will work. Okay, uh, hey, hey everybody. Um, I am going to take a quick drink. So is a good idea. Yep, we can see, we can okay. see your screen. Um, Excellent. Take it away. Thanks very All much. All right. So uh, yesterday was a big birthday for landscape architecture, and it's totally my goal that everybody achieve climate uh, bingo uh, in this uh, uh, final presentation. Um, the uh, interesting thing about uh, uh, Olmsted, uh, you probably know him for um, uh, Central Park, uh, among many other parks. Uh, pick your city, and I guarantee you there is a uh, Frederick Law Olmsted work uh, nearby. He uh, uh, coined landscape architecture, but he did so many other things. He was, he was this uh, super uh, polymath um, that was not actually great at finding uh, careers for a while, but he was a, a journalist for the Proto New York Times. He uh, wrote uh, so, some novels. He was a farmer. He was a civil engineer. Uh, and then Ultimately, he became what he coined as a landscape architect, and uh, he was really wrestling with some profound issues that probably don't have as many things that you think of when you think of landscape. You think about, oh, nature uh, restoring, uh, you know, your health to, to being in a natural place, but, um, and, and also just beauty, um, but he was really you know, responding to the context of a nation that was uh, tearing itself apart. Uh, the, the Civil War um, happened right basically a few years after uh, the Central Park Commission was, was won. And uh, then he joined uh, the union effort to lead the Sanitary Commission. And so all the medical logistics that was being done by this guy. And uh, he was also, you know, 
you know, before the Civil War happened, he was really uh, freaked out by the amount of division in the country, both in terms of class and how, um, you know, how cruel humans could be to one another. And uh, he was trying to figure out, well, what is the solution? And he, it, he went to England and he went to this place called Birkenhead Park and he saw people of every station in life, you know, in highly stratified uh, uh, England uh, engaging with the, each other and connecting. And he's like, oh my God, this might be a solution. So he, he looked at, at parks and places, not just as nice to haves, but he was actually trying to figure out how to solve big social problems uh, and economic problems and environmental problems, because this is also when uh, the cholera epidemics were raging uh, in our densest cities. And so um, a big work like the Back Bay Fins in Boston as part of the Emerald Necklace, that was his work trying to figure out what to do with sewage. Uh, so it, it, it's amazing, really, all the things this guy was thinking about. And when look at the the work to do today in some ways i'm just uh thinking as late like okay back then they had you know we were intensely divided uh lots of anti-immigration rhetoric terrible environmental problems uh that he was he was ta he invented a whole profession to deal with it so now now i'm asking it's like well what can what can we do to do more um and I've had the opportunity uh, to do work from uh, what I call uh, LA to LA, uh, from uh, Ile de Jean Charles, Louisiana to uh, the LA River, um, and really encountered some profound problems that I'm not necessarily going to say say that I know the answers to, but uh, they're the things that I think we all need to be thinking about uh, for the future in the context of of the climate crisis. Uh, uh, Yale de Jean Charles was really about understanding uh, a, com a community that uh, had lost all the protective wetlands around it, much the way that um, Agatha was talking about, you know, the protective power of oysters, the protective power of wetlands around Louisiana was lost. And this uh, 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 indigenous community you know, were called the first climate uh, refugees because they were literally going under uh, in the United States because um, hurricanes were just washing over them. And we had to uh, look at, at, at relocating them and, and what retreat really meant and how devastating uh, an experience it was. And then the LA River, it's such um, a painful thing where you have a, a river that was totally transformed to concrete and lost um, much of its um, ecological um, uh, components and it's it's this very strict engineered thing that is basically just sending uh polluted water to uh you know out out, out to, to long beach but the the problem is is that our cities are uh are really complicated set of pre-existing conditions that you simply can't restore them back to uh ecology um Working on, on different projects is you wind up um, really trying to think and project about the future. And uh, I, I kind of drew this cartoon. I, I've been practicing uh, drawing faux, I guess, faux New Yorker cartoons. But this is uh, the scientist just taking a, a guess between the different ways things could go. You know, do they go to Paris? Do they go to melting the glaciers? Do they go to you know, the most terrible things that we could do to ourselves um, with the different um, levels of uh, heat increase due to um, uh, the contribution of um, uh, heat warming gases. And this has really been something that I've been struggling with in, um, in Puerto Rico, a place that has gotten uh, twice, as, uh, twice as many hot nights um, as it did in uh, since the 1960s. It's um, you're already seeing sea level uh, increase, the waters are warmer, and um, the storms are getting more intense, although the rainfall overall is, is less. And those are all the contradictions of climate change. Uh, seas are higher, less rain, but, but bigger storms, um, just all sorts of weird things start happening. 
and things that uh, I didn't know about uh, uh, really delving into understanding climate change and where things could go was no one in the media, I, f- I feel like, is really breaking down what the different projections mean. Uh, you know, we like to hear it, you know, it's one number and it's going one way, but there's there's really multiple paths um, and they have very complicated uh, uh, identities behind them, but they're almost like a, a terrible role-playing game where a shared socio-economic uh, pathway leads to a certain amount of heat generated, which, you know, causes uh, a certain amount of global warming. And forever I was, uh, I was like, okay, but which, uh, which ones are more likely, which ones are, are less likely? Uh, and uh, pouring through uh, IPCC 6 and then how do, how do we translate this into a conversation that everybody uh, can have? So the, the Paris Climate Acc- Accord that, you know, keeps uh, temperatures uh, closer uh, to um, their historic condition was known as the uh, Shared Socioeconomic Pathway 1, which is, they, they called it this complicated thing because it was about what we do as a society leads to how much warming we have. If we're if we're not having too many wars, if we're not you know uh, uh, using too much fossil f- uh, fuels, and, and we're looking at alternative energy, and we're we're using resources more efficiently, you know, then we have better outcomes. It's kind of like a weird version of of a Christmas carol. If I'm good, Timmy will live, and I will live. Um, but but that's really what they what they are when you when you start to to look at them. And uh, help me right now. We're, we're tracking intermediate, which is. Uh, 4.5, which is not really a great outcome. It's a uh, it's a, a much hotter planet uh, and a lot a lot of sea level rise. But it's uh, not likely that we're going to be in the in the worst of of all cases. Um, and so this is this is how actually you know we have to report you know to um, when we do our work for for public entities we they, you know they say okay what do I need to plan for, you know, when we build infrastructure, like, like what's the right sea level target? I've heard six feet, I've heard, you know, two feet, you know, what, what's the number? And, uh, and there's a, there's basically a sliding scale between how critical is it that we get it um, uh, right, or at least um, more conservative than, than less conservative. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, a game of, of calculated uh, risks, uh, versus versus outcomes, but I, I think that that people uh, w- would really benefit from from seeing this context. The other thing is is that the infrastructure systems that build our cities and our places, um, we we need a lot of better self care to our cities because we we need uh, to quit sprawling and going out. We need to to stay um, within, but that means that we have to make our cities uh, more humane and and, and healthy. And we're at a tipping point with the th- uh, with infrastructure that really builds the scale of our cities. Whether we're talking about roads or whether we're talking about power generation, um, we've had the post World War II history of infrastructure was really uh, divisive. It was infrastructure that didn't really build cultural uh, or community. On the, on the right is a picture of uh, uh, Detroit, where one of the freeways just blew away. Um, an existing uh, historic black neighborhood. Uh, this legacy of, of urban renewal was a way of we built infrastructure that just further divided ourselves. So thinking about this, to me, this is ultimately a landscape question because landscapes are how we connect uh, to each other. Um, and we've had you know periods where we could really think big about uh, landscapes and environment uh, that have you know vacillated through the years, and I. I do want to make the case that this is a time where we need to figure out how we all put ourselves together. But during uh, the New Deal, there's this uh, really amazing vision through the Farm Services Administration of building shelter belts and working with farmers, just like, uh, you know, one on one on one, teaching them uh, uh, methods and, and, give, and giving them opportunities to help control uh, the soil and tame um, soil erosion. And in five years, they were able to reverse uh, many of the effects of the Dust Bowl, which was just an extraordinary outcome. Um, the uh, way that, that we look uh, at 
how places are built and put together. We, we think of uh, the materials, the, the energy, the water. These are the life support systems of, of community. And we also put out waste and, um, you know, and hopefully we recycle more than we waste. But, but those are all things in terms of our system. And the more that we can learn to look at our communities uh, and keep it local, the better off we'll be. Um, but right now, we're kind of growing through this period that, you know, the, the apocalypse isn't necessarily for uh, horsemen that, you know, are, are the branding entities for uh, disease and war and pestilence. They, um, they, they come to us in, in more subtle and, and devious ways, such as the, the, what it costs uh, for utilities or what it costs for food, uh, you know, uh, escalates beyond what most people can afford. The environment uh, creates conditions that are not healthy and, and people um, have asthma and, and the, these other uh, kinds of chronic pulmonary, pulmonary diseases. Um, and that's, that's more insidious. Uh, I wish it could be more of an upfront thing. And what we, uh, I, I hope, advocate for our future is, you know, almost every, every species has a, a stable relationship uh, with, with the earth, the, you, their population uh, consumes in the context of the, the resources um, that are renewable around it. There are cases, of course, when we mix species and populations in different ecosystems to create massive disruption, but our species uh, is super disruptive because <laughs> we've tied our wagons to uh, mostly non-renewable resources that um, become less and less and less. And that's, that's a strangulation to us and to um, our environment. And as an optimist, I see us going in a way that we, we can begin to wean ourselves off of that. And I really am optimistic about that. I think that's what the, the future uh, is about, is, is finding our, our renewable resources. And that's what our generation's culture uh, can bring. Um, but we face dire uh, uh, situation between um, you know, after Hurricane uh, Sandy, we, we studied, um, you know, how will sea level rise impact uh, communities and found that climate change um, is going to be one of the things uh, that is the great gentrifier of the coastlines. And it's not just the um, Northeast, it's everywhere where uh, people who are very wealthy can stay and rebuild. People who are middle class um, will um, move out to uh, more stable uh, places, uh, and the very poor um, will uh, uh, be left behind, uh, but without any resources, at least the way that our, our current strategies are structured. An example of that is in uh, Canyon Martin Pena, which is a community in, in Puerto Rico, where um, they uh, actually sugarcane farming collapsed in the 1930s, People went to San, San Juan to look for jobs. Uh, they had no housing, so they settled in this kind of unclaimed land of the uh, tropical estuary uh, between um, San Juan Bay and, the San, and around the San Jose Lagoon. Uh, they had, we've been working with them for the past um, couple of years to develop a plan that copes with sea level rise um, and does a very fine-scaled uh, relocation of housing um, and has built in a model of measuring um, uh, uh, sea level rise to understand where the impacts are going to be. Um, the size of Canyon Martin Pena is the size of Hoboken, New Jersey, if you know, know that. So imagine uh, you can't tell people to simply retreat from there. I mean, if you look at the housing crisis, there's nowhere for people to go. So um, they have a very innovative model of a, um, a, a land trust organization that is going to build houses that um, can't be taken by, by gentrification because the land trust will have price controls on the housing and the agreements with um, the residents who have been there locally. And the process has really been to figure out how do we keep, how do we revive the water quality of the estuary how do we build in an infrastructure uh, retrofitted to this community um, that they haven't had, and then also help keep their identity and agency in place? One of the things that I've 
found as a great moral dilemma of um, the retreat arguments is that um, uh, most of, many of the, of the people who um, wound, wound up settling uh, in areas that um, uh, are flood prone or other climate uh, risk prone um, is because they were given nowhere else to go and they weren't allowed to, uh, to build and settle elsewhere and they built a strong community identity there. And we're going to have to measure the benefits of social capital, which are very powerful and, and meaningful to health and welfare outcomes with um, the, uh, the risk exposures of climate change. And it's a more subtle and complicated argument. And of course, we don't wanna be expanding where people you know, build in, in vulnerable areas. We need to be incentivizing where people can live in the healthiest areas. But we haven't had, I think, the nuanced conversations uh, about this. Another fundamental problem is that um, we, we carry these romantic visions of nature that I, I call the three bears. You know, one is, is the submission of nature, which I call the, the bear rug. Two is a kind of fear of nature where we have to eliminate a problem, which is the bear break in. Uh, and then the third is, is we have a kind of absurd uh, relationship with nature that is well intended, but not really how nature wants to work. And I call that the bear hug. Um, an example of that is along the Los Angeles River. Many people badly want to see the steelhead uh, salmon re uh, return, the southern steelhead salmon return to the LA River. Um, uh, historically in Southern California, it had this uh, uh, relationship uh, with the river systems where uh, it would uh, be born in these sh uh, shaded creek uh, shallow areas, and then it would make its way uh, uh, down the river stream uh, to the estuary of the bay, and then it would go to the ocean, and then finally it would return back. But that you know place doesn't exist uh, anymore. What exists is water that moves faster than those fish can move upstream, and um, there are a million people living within a, um, a half mile of the of the Los Angeles River. And so the, the water that's being contributed to it is no longer, uh, you can't have a restoration uh, pre-settlement benchmark for species. So what we've done is we've looked at ways to uh, make the river a healthier and the watershed overall healthier and looked at ways that life can engage uh, the river uh, through these uh, um, strategic platforms that connect both people and nature to parks and to certain uh, uh, crossing areas. But we're also not turning back the clock because if we, if, if we did, we would have to depopulate Los Angeles. Um, and this comes to the science of things. You know, uh, living systems are built from, you know, those powerful substrates um, that, that, that are that are there, the, the mineral and chemistry uh, and the life support that's in the soil from the, the mycorrhizae giving rise to vegetative systems, giving rise to, to insect uh, and pollinators, and then uh, to, to larger scale um, fauna, that they, it's all dependent on that kind of base uh, chemistry of relationships. So when you build cities, if you're changing the microclimate because it's hotter overall, uh, if you're displacing the, the amount of species uh, and having a lot of humans as an introduced species, and the moisture profile is changing because it's more uh, impervious and water moves through it faster, and the surface is made out of a chemistry that's mostly alkaline, you can expect it to be the same thing as the natural world. Even if you fix you know, a few square feet of it, you can't say that everything is fine because it's all connected. Um, this is a, you know, an example of what the urban city system looks like. So what I'm advocating is that we recognize the, the ecology of cities, that we need to clean the water of them. We need to find the species that work with them. We need to make it self care for, for humans and concentrate ourselves uh, there. Um, and make, you know, these kind of urban habitats for ourselves. Um, and I think New York is just, you know, an incredible habitat that should live and thrive and be more. Uh, I like to work, work in places that, you know, are banged up 
um, and re-envision life for them. Uh, like Hunts Point feeds 22 million people. It's a working waterfront. It's a working community. And we tried to propose a working ecology and flood protection for it. It's currently not flood protected. Uh, it uh, managed to miss the worst of Hurricane Sandy, but uh, it's only a matter of time. This is the one of the greatest uh, food supply centers of the tri-state region. Um, and we proposed a way to both make the water healthier, support uh, the billion oysters, uh, and to uh, protect um, from future floods. Another thing that I like to look at is, is, is waste. How do we transform our waste into something living and vibrant? Uh, working with glass and food compost to build soils because I don't want to be borrowing soils from other places. We just opened up uh, uh, Sojourner Truth Park, which was a landscape that was mined uh, as an industrial site for um, over 200 years. Uh, and now it is a recovering ecology that can tell us, you know, about climate change because it's not a precious intact piece of nature. It's a piece of nature that we are cultivating and bringing into a better future. And I think that's where um, we need to go. And that is why science is awesome. And um, I thank you uh, for your time and just letting me just empty it all out. Uh, but it's both a, a social thing as much as it is any calculation. Thanks so much, Richard. That was a really great perspective. Um, and I think um, you never know when you plan these events, how well the different talks are gonna fit together, but tonight I think worked out really well. Um, we do have some questions for you. Um, so the first one is in a lot of the sort of case studies that you presented, it, it sounded like there was a very, um, you know, place specific, factors that you needed to take into account, um, you know, in, involving a lot of investigation of the local environment and, you know, innovations, but are there larger infrastructure lessons that we can implement, you know, sort of on a larger scale rather than having to go, I'm, I'm you know, all these projects sound wonderful, right? But um, do we really have to take this, this localized approach or, you know, are there sort of um, more less custom uh, options that, that we can use to really protect infrastructure and, and restore coastlines? I, I, I think uh, there's, some, there's some kind of like basic tenets that uh, uh, I think can be applied everywhere is, is that one, uh, I think the solutions are local and custom uh, because that's how we function at, at people and at the community at the community scale. But I, I think the the transformative factors um, are, uh, you know, how do we get our cities to be uh, cooler? How do we um, uh, minimize the amount of what I'd call exurban uh, development, which is kind of uh, piecemeal, uh, fragmentary development um, with respect to to infrastructure, we really need um, to optimize towards, you know, tra concentrated transportation networks. Uh, that that would be, you know, a fundamental kind of federal solution and shift, and that may uh, mean, you know, uh, more viable uh, trains and public transportation systems than we've had. They they will be fundamental towards carbon reduction, uh, but. Um, uh, Waste is, is super local, so, so it needs local solutions. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, glass is, 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 has very little uh, recycling happening uh, to it because uh, to have it be reprocessed uh, cost effectively, you have to separate it by color. Uh, and you uh, have to have a, a reprocessing plant nearby. And there's very uh, few mass producing, you know, uh, uh, glass areas per, you know, uh, per city and place. So um, turning glass back into soil uh, was a, a kind of novel idea to, uh, to make it hyper local as well as uh, food compost. Take those two things and you're dealing with 26% of the waste of any municipality anywhere. Um, getting your cities cooler overall and uh, finding an urban forest that works for where you live is, is fundamental in terms of one, both the quality of life of making things shadier, shadier and cooler, but also doing something about water quality at scale. So some solutions are local. Uh, 
Uh, and then some s solutions to, to climate are uh, large federal structures uh, in terms of sp specifically uh, uh, transportation and energy production. Sort of following up on that uh, glass and compost, we have another question. Um, what are some of the creative ways communities are closing the loop on the waste they produce? Um, I, I think th that uh, recycling needs reinvention. Uh, it is uh, right now something that, that has been um, uh, harder to make a local thing, but, but in, in Philadelphia, there's a, a great nonprofit called um, uh, Bottle Underground, uh, where they look at uh, uh, collecting a, a glass and, and they, make, they make art pieces with it. They, they, they make uh, new serving ware um, uh, out of glass um, and, they turn, and they turn that into kind of a bespoke um, uh, product. Um, I think that in, when we look for green jobs, one of the, the fascinating things about waste is that in the Northeast, you know, it's costing us about, um, uh, you have the, the collection side, which is usually uh, city, city workers um, and how much it costs per ton to, to collect garbage on that side. But let's say it costs $100. And then the disposal and tipping fee um, of that waste, you know, say another $100 to $150. So like $250 per ton just goes into storing or, or burning material. But, but if we if we put that same amount of money towards uh, finding a second life for that material stream, uh, that is, I think, a, a next major endeavor. And actually, I guess I realized that one good example of local waste recycling is the oyster shell thing that Agatha talked about. So it's a very specialized case, of course, but... And the rise of food, food composting. I mean, that is becoming a, a huge thing. Uh, and, and again, that is, that is a ridiculous, huge portion of our landfills is, is food waste. That should never yeah. happen. Unfortunately, in New York City, as part of the COVID-related budget cuts, they stopped doing curbside compost pickup in most places, um, which I find unfortunate. But um, hopefully that'll that'll come back soon. I don't want to get too political here. Um, okay. I think I'm mindful of time. So I think we'd better wrap up. So I want to say thank you to Richard and to our other speakers this evening, um, Marco and Agata, who unfortunately have had to drop off the call, but um, I want to thank them and thank you to all of our audience and to the other New York City Taste of Science uh, volunteers, Catherine, Vic, Rosemary, and Samira who all helped to make this event happen. Um, we hope you guys enjoyed this event. Um, as a reminder, if you have a completed bingo board, you can either screenshot it or you can download it um, and send it to New York at tasteofscience.org um, and make sure to send us your address as well. Um, and selected winners will get mailed an actual physical piece of Taste of Science swag. Um, in addition, um, because we're not having in-person events, we're, we've sort of lost our biggest source of income. So if you um, feel so inclined, you can give us a donation at tasteofscience.org. Um, there's a donate button on our homepage. On our homepage. Um, and I also just want to remind you that this event is just one in a series of events. Um, they've been going on for the last about week and a half, so we're getting towards the end. Um, but for example, there will be a trivia night this weekend, um, and so you can find out more about all of that on our um, on our homepage, tasteofscience.org. Um, we really hope to be back to doing um, in-person events in New York City this summer, um, so stay tuned and, and sign up for our newsletter, and, and you'll be informed as soon as that happens. Um, and finally, we'll post a video of this event to our YouTube channel along with uh, links to all of our speakers so that you can continue to follow their work or maybe follow up with them. I know some of you had some additional questions. Um, so thanks everybody. We hope to see you in person at a, a bar somewhere in New York City soon um, and have a great night. Bye. <laughs>